guys, how's it going? Cameron Van Hoy here with my man Austin Trukanowski. Uh, ready to talk all things movies here at the Arnor Podcast. Buckle your seatbelts because this is going to be a wild ride. <laughs> Am I right, intro. Austin? Definitely, Thank yeah, you. definitely a wild Thank ride. Um, yeah, we got a few interesting subjects to talk about. Interesting movie that I'm really looking forward to talking about. I think it's going to be a good discussion today. Um, yeah. But our opening topic is something you actually brought my attention to. Um, it's the the film market in China, the more, more specifically the market for like in-person theater viewing in China. And there were two movies specifically uh, that were brought up in this topic. There was a podcast that you'd brought my attention to, um, Battle at Lake Changjin and Wolf Warrior 2. Those were the two movies um, sort of at the forefront of this discussion. Um, I don't yeah. know too much about them. So yeah, let me know what uh, you know about them. Well, start. So, so yeah, we're going to talk about these two movies, uh, Wolf Warrior and the other one is The Battle at Lake Changing. Um, and I had heard about these two films from this guy named Balaji. Uh, I'm going to butcher his last name. Srinivasan, I think is his last name is how you pronounce it. And I love listening to this guy because I find him to be so smart. He's in the world of... Um, blockchain okay he was the he was the cto for coinbase which is like probably the largest blockchain or crypto uh, exchange out there and i love listening to this guy because he speaks in hypotheticals and uh he's so smart and just so well thought out and um he's always like bringing things to my attention that i would never know about that i'm interested in and so he started talking about these two films which are chinese movies which i believe the battle at lake changjin which is it came out this year mm -hmm. um and i haven't seen the film but it came out this year and the story is about uh this battle in north korea against the north koreans i believe and the americans where the americans get hammered okay they just right. get their asses handed to them um and it's the most expensive film ever made by china the budget was i think uh, over 200 million dollars wow okay yeah and the chinese normally don't make films this expensive like this is like movies getting more and more expensive for the chinese has been a thing like they, they certainly are not anywhere near i mean you know america seems to turn out like multiple of these 200 plus million dollar movies a year and yeah. we're kind of the only ones who do it china is quickly catching up in that and I believe this, this, this is the first. Um, but what's so interesting about this film and then its predecessor, at least in the way of theme, is this movie Wolf Warrior, is that both of them make the Americans the bad guys. Right. Kind of like kind of like what America's always done for years with the Russians or the Germans. Yep. Right is, you know, they're our go-to bad guy for any Bond story or for you know, any kind of war movie you want to make, or even if it's, you know, like The Kingsman or something like that, you know, it's generally one of those two. And, and, and that makes sense because we have fought wars, great wars with these people, right? Whether it's the Germans, who we're, we're not in any active conflict with now, but, you know, the Nazis were were some bad dudes right and uh, and then the russians who were still like very contentious with as americans um and this will actually be interesting to discuss with you because you're canadian yes um and so you have a very different lens on all this but it um so yeah so these two films are like this sort of new um i don't know what you just, it's like a new the chinese aren't really known for making aggressive movies against the americans it's not a thing that they do normally. Mm -hmm. but obviously tensions have risen between america and the chinese recently uh from the previous administration through covid now this one um and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of people on the world stage i think who are talking about or worrying about where things could go between you know the chinese and american relationship and so it's just i think it's something worth talking about how their movies now are starting to are not only starting to show this uh you know contention but these movies were the, the highest grossing films in chinese history both yeah. of them so the audiences loved them you know so what, what do you make of this um yeah i mean the the one it was Battle of Lake Changjin specifically I was reading about and they talked about how uh, it was connected to basically this running theme now in their films that I, I think it's becoming more 
prominent and it's just appealing to that like aggressive nationalism um really pushing for like the communist themes in that and yeah it just proves how big an audience there is there for film and they're really not pandering may, maybe pandering but they're they're appealing to their audiences you know their beliefs their values um and yeah it's just proving how big that market is um because this movie the battle of lake change in again specifically when i was reading about it it really did not perform well outside of china at all and i read that there were no like credits um in like english in the film um i don't even think they cast american actors they had like french actors playing the americans so they were not at all concerned with the for them the foreign market like over in us uk it was specifically for them uh so it's really interesting because the, now they're you know hollywood is sort of the go to for film that's what everyone thinks of but china's obviously got its own booming industry right now huge audience for it and yeah they're producing it specifically for that yeah i mean you know the chinese have always been very particular about what movies are played in china mm -hmm. for a long time hollywood fought hard to try to break into that market and still does oh know, yeah for to, sure to get some share in the chinese market especially disney who yeah. has probably made the biggest strides as far as the chinese market being that they have you know like uh where they got the two disneyland parks one's in hong kong and one's in beijing i think i think so uh, yeah well, yeah it's in beijing i believe and uh and then you know getting like the marvel films in there but even still you know whenever a movie goes to china it's, it's like it has to pass all these rigorous Yep. kind of censorship rules and then the the percentages of the box office are split in like a very uneven way and there's no real um like accounting from what i've heard like a lot of these companies can't really get great accounting on how well the films did within china so it's um it's you know that's always been a thing the chinese are i think more concerned with making their own films for their people yeah. and like keeping and keeping control over the conversation and the content that's being made. And it's a very aggressive approach. It seems to be a very aggressive approach towards America being the bad guy, you know? Right. And um, I guess that's, I, I don't know, to me, it's kind of concerning because of where tensions are between the two countries, but it's also very interesting um, just because I love movies and the idea that you can kind of look at history and, and, politics through the lens of films is pretty cool to me yeah definitely yeah i mean films are always going to reflect the times they're in which is weird um but it's like you're saying there are tensions and a movie like this sort of reflects that um but yeah you look back to like the 80s at the height of the cold war you had obviously the james bond movies that were coming out at that time even something as simple as a boxing movie with uh rocky four was so reflective of the conflict between the u.s and russia um yeah. so yeah now you've got a movie like this coming out in this time and it's very obviously pro-china anti-us they're the bad guys which yeah that's something the u.s has been doing for a long time so i, I understand why you find it concerning but it, it's also interesting because america's been, been doing that for a really long time as well no i absolutely and mm -hmm. and i guess it's a great point and when i say i find it concerning it's i'm just trying to protect my own skin here you know right. what I mean? it's like <laughs> it's like well it's like it's concerning when someone else does it against you but yes right. when america's aggressive against others you kind of <laughs> sit in the power position which you know it's really interesting to think about it, it makes me think of the scene from uh inglorious bastards yeah which i think is such a genius scene and i remember watching it and going like oh it's so great uh, the movie theater scene when all the Germans are in this in the theater watching the German war movie where the Americans are the bad guys and the Germans are the good guys. And it's just it's just great because, you know, it like kind of culminates in these moments where you see all the Germans in this theater like cheering on these, you know, kills that they're getting in the movie. And it's almost like holding a mirror up to the viewer in mm -hmm. an interesting way, because here we have been watching this movie and cheering on the Americans the entire way. Um, so it was it was just such like great filmmaking. It's such a great opportunity that he made use of. Although, you know, if I, I mean, trying to objectively, 
the Americans are certainly the ones to cheer for in that yeah. in that instance. You know what I mean? Like, there's no question. Um, and I, I kind of feel the same way about this situation with America and China. You mm-hmm. know, like America to all of its faults. And I don't want to get into anything political, but like, you know, um, I just. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not personally like a fan of communism and, and the idea that like China is becoming a bit more aggressive and, and we're starting to see it um, in their films and in their politics, I do think is concerning. Yeah, I understand that. Um, I'm unfortunately, I'm just not like an overly political person. I don't have any like strong convictions either way. Um, so in terms of contributing to the conversation that way, I don't have like many leanings, but uh, I, I definitely, I see your point of view completely on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, should we jump into our movie? Yeah, I'm down. Um, you want me to kick us off on that? Yeah, go ahead. All right. So uh, the movie we're talking about is the new release from Edgar Wright, very popular British filmmaker, who's um, he originated with sort of British comedies and now has been making increasingly... I don't know if they're bigger budget, but they're more mainstream, wide appeal. They're less specific to that kind of British humor. Um, And he's branching out to different genres. And his latest movie is Last Night in Soho, which is a horror film. I don't know how he describe it. It's kind of, it's got elements of like De Palma thrillers. Um, But yeah, it's, it was interesting. I want to hear your thoughts first, because you were, you recommended this one for the podcast. I have some pretty strong feelings about it. Uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about it. Oh wow, I can't wait to hear. Yeah, um, I, I would I would I would classify the movie as an erotic thriller. Okay. Um, and it's actually a genre that I love. Yeah, I love the erotic thriller, and I feel like it's one of the more underserved genres in the yeah. world. Um, and I think it's one of the best. And I was I really enjoyed the film. I genuinely really enjoyed the film. Um, I think that he's got this thing that he seems to do, which is look, the movie's very musical. Yep. Right. It, it, it's, I don't want to say thin on plot. Right. But they are like, even baby driver is kind of thin on plot until the end. Yes. And then you get like a load of information, which wraps it all up. Uh, I think uh, Scott Pilgrim is probably the same way as well. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly like they're, they're very energetic, these movies. You know, they're just like these dancey, musical, energetic roller coaster rides yeah. that, um, that, uh, that are very entertaining uh this one i really enjoyed i enjoyed the tone i enjoyed the world uh i liked it more than baby driver personally really? yeah i did uh only because i felt like baby driver it was a cool movie man really cool movie um but it it felt a little too bubble gummy to me for yeah. my own personal tastes whereas like this was right in my pocket aesthetically tonally um the genre like yeah i just i really dug it and i thought it was great filmmaking um and i thought he did what he does really well with it that, that, that was my that was my overall thought all right so <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately i wasn't a big fan um there's definitely some things i like about it um but i guess to start i would say that one of the things i've always been a really big fan of with edgar wright is i feel he's always got a very firm handle on the style of his films. I I feel like there's always a ton of attention to detail, all the shots and transitions and everything feels just very deliberate and thought out. Um, And this film, the thing that stood out to me right away was it, it kind of looked flat um, in terms of just the colors. Like there wasn't a lot of contrast going on. And that at first I thought it was maybe just going to be like the modern day stuff because there's this whole um, sort of contrast between the modern day and then this like time travel element where she goes back and has these visions of the past and that stuff did look pretty good they had some really good lighting there definitely some nice shots i i just expected it to be a little more out there stylistically um and then yeah the plot it felt a little thin 
I don't feel like he connected all the dots the way I would have wanted him to. And then my main issue with it was just, I felt like he was out of his depth in terms of dealing with some of the social issues. Um, he handled some stuff like mental illness and misogyny and it felt surface level to me. It was almost as if like, and I, I don't want to be insulting, but it felt like a university student trying to tackle some heavy themes in their student film and just like the learning curve isn't quite there. Um, the nuance to handle it, it's, it's just a very quick observation, but not really diving into it, giving it the, the nuance it needs. And I think that almost goes back to Baby Driver where the characters are very thin. Um, I can understand some people thinking that his stuff a lot of times is style over substance because in Baby Driver, especially uh, the character of the girlfriend, Deborah, there, there's really nothing there. Um, and so I find it interesting that he'd go on to make a movie with a female lead and sort of try to handle all these social issues around it. Um, it just didn't land for me in that way. Uh, you talked about the erotic thriller before. That's another genre that I'm personally like, I rank it very high. When I watch those movies, it's like, those are the ultimate, they don't make them like they used to uh, movies. And I almost wish he just fully leaned into that, cut the time travel element and just made it like a trashy noir set in the 60s, like just fully embrace like his De Palma influence, uh, like Polanski and that just, just made it feel like a little more grimy. Um, but as it stands, yeah, I just, it just didn't click for me, this movie. Interesting. I mean, look, he definitely did erotic thriller Edgar Wright style. That's yes. for sure. Like he's not doing, you know, the De Palma erotic thriller right. um, or like, you know, like basic instinct uh, mm. by any means. It's, it's still got that layer of, uh, you know, bubble gum to an extent. Yeah. You know, it's, it, and that, that's just what he does. His movies are, I think he tries to make films for a very wide audience. Yeah. Uh, I, as far as like tackling social issues, I don't really agree with that. You know, I won. I don't know that he was trying to tackle any social issues. I think that you can make a movie and utilize someone who might have a mental health issue uh, or what we used to call back in the day is just crazy mm -hmm. um, or, you know, have characters that are using their power over other people in a awful way as villains are supposed to do in movies. Right. Uh, and may it be, you know, whether that's sexually or misogynistically or whatever it is, the gamut of villains throughout the history of film. I don't think every time you have characters or scenarios, uh, you know, I, not everything is a social statement. I don't think that is the case. And I know, oh, God, a lot of people would disagree with me on that. Right. Um, but I don't think everything is, uh, you know, one movie that, that, you know, the Palma is also very musical in the way that he would do these films. Like you think about a movie like Body Double, mm -hmm. right? Like Body Double is just very organic and um, yeah, it's like a musical. You know what I mean? Like things are there like um, just to get you to the next step almost, you know, so you can like stay on this ride. It's not, you know, you're not learning information through dialogue, really. You're not... Um, I don't know. I, it's hard, it's kind of hard to articulate, but yeah. Anyways, body doubles is very similar to me in, in it's like, you know, what else is also very similar to me to this um, is the early erotic thriller. It was an earlier one by De Palma. I think it's obsession. The one that Paul Schrader wrote. Oh, I wasn't aware that he was part of that, but I have seen obsession. That's the one with, um, uh, remember the guy's name, but he plays uncle Ben in the Spider-Man movies. And, yep. uh, Lithgow yes. is like he's yes. double crossed by him. It's John, kind of like a Vertigo yeah, John, remake, right? Right. Yeah. Well, okay. So even okay, Vertigo is it? Yes. So this is there's there's a there's a there's a theme here, right? So but we can even go back further, right? De Palma has said that he was when he was doing his erotic thrillers, he was trying to bring back what Hitchcock was doing. Yeah. This genre of movie that no one was really doing anymore, that he 
thought was amazing and was really trying to bring it. And Vertigo is a great example. Vertigo is also very musical. The Bernard Herman score. I mean, I think there are like, there's like one 20 minute sequence in there where Jimmy Stewart is just following her around, right. you know, driving through the streets of San Francisco as this music is going and you're learning information by just kind of watching things and the camera's like kind of pushing and telling you what to see at a very specific moment. Um, and it is, it uh, you know it's I, the musical is the best term I can come up. With. It's, it's it's it kind of pulls you through, um, in in this really well choreographed way. There's a choreography to it all, and Body Double does the same thing. Dressed to Kill also mm-hmm. does the same thing, you know. And Obsession does the same thing. In fact, like the beginning of Obsession, it, it's kind of the same with the beginning of Dressed to Kill. There are these sequences, you know, Dressed to Kill. It's the museum sequence. In Obsession, it's the girl being kidnapped sequence, but they're kind of set to a score. That's yeah. like the first piece, you know, like there's this music that starts and then the camera just starts leading you and then we'll suddenly move quickly and reveal something else. And then there's, of course, all the beautiful movement, which gives that feeling of dance. Um, and that's how you're learning what's going on. And so it's that is very Edgar Wright. You know, yeah. like that, that is super like his style. And then talk about like a social issue, uh, Dressed to Kill. I don't even see, this is a great example. Dressed to Kill is about a guy who is a uh, serial killer, but he's transgender, right? He right. dresses as a woman and thinks he's a woman to kill other people. And um, it's, you know, like today, I don't think you can make that movie. No. I think that I think that today, if you were to be like, "Hey, um, this is a character who's a villain who has a mental illness, who is transgender," um, that people would be very upset, you know. But back in the day, he was just using that as a means for a villain, yeah, uh, and also a means for a device, you know. Yeah, uh, for him, it was a great device in order to throw the audience off from knowing who the killer was, because anytime you saw the killer, you saw a woman. And then when you followed who you thought was one of your protagonists, um, you were like, oh, well, there's no way it's he's not the killer because we know the killer is a woman. Right. You know, uh, so it was a great device that he was able to use to throw you off. And I don't think he was trying to explore a social issue or mental illness in any great way. Uh, I think he was just using motifs and devices in order to send the audience on a wild ride. And that's what I think Edgar Wright does here. You right. know, he's not, he's not exploring um, mental health. You know, like there are plenty of other filmmakers who will do that and are doing that nowadays. I think he's just using a really wonderful world you know, 1960s London and uh, and a lot of cinematic motifs to to give us a, a fucking wild ride, man. That's fair. Yeah, I I can see that. I guess my thing was just like I felt like he was trying to connect, like make a through line through the the stuff in the 60s with Anya Taylor Joy's character, um, you know, being pimped out by Matt Smith's character, and then the sort of like weird campus culture that uh thomas mckenzie's character found her found herself in with like the guys sort of acting like sexually aggressive making advances towards her um but yeah like i, I don't but think the guy, the but, but the guys the guys at the school it was really another girl who was bad to her at school right yeah but there, there were also there was the one guy in the bar that just said something inappropriate like it wasn't it wasn't like in your face obvious i thought it was there a little bit um I don't necessarily think that was the entire his reasoning for making that movie. It almost felt to me like a side thing that he kind of stumbled upon in the writing and sort of had it there. He kept it in. But uh, yeah, but I do agree with you, though, that he definitely Edgar Wrighted it, Mm -hmm. which is kind of just like playing it down, which is unfortunately that's the problem with the genre now. Right. uh, The erotic thriller is that they're not that erotic anymore, you know, and I once heard someone talk about the genre dying coming into the 90s as like internet porn became a thing right Right. like people had this accessibility to just watching you know getting that eroticism in like a really quick kind of cheap way uh and it 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 
probably took some of the market share away from the erotic thriller, you know, but like erotic thrillers really thrived leading up to internet porn. And, and, and I think there's a reason like, like uh, whatever it's, you know, I don't know, you probably teach an anthropology class on it, but uh, I think that there's, there's something there. Um, and unfortunately now, you know, like one, you don't really get nudity in movies anymore the way you used to anyways, like back in the eighties, comedies had nudity. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the Revenge of the Nerds had nudity. <laughs> right. um, like I don't think there's ever been a Seth Rogen movie with any nudity, right? Yeah. Like, so it, it, nudity doesn't really even happen in mainstream movies the way it used to anymore, and it certainly doesn't happen in the erotic thriller. So that, I think that is a problem with the genre, and and I think an Edgar Wright tackling an erotic thriller didn't really do much for it. In my, I guess, if I had to agree with what you're saying simply because he still left out most of the eroticism. Right. Yeah, I get that. Um, what do you think of the performances in this? I thought, it was gr- I thought they were great. Yeah. I, I did. I like Anya Taylor-Joy a lot. Um, I think she's definitely one of the most talented actresses of her generation. I felt she was like almost underutilized, but it wasn't her movie. Um, she was like a side character, but... I would have liked to see more from her, honestly, with the flashbacks. But that was the thing for me overall is like, I really would have liked to be more immersed into that 60s world than the modern day stuff almost. Like I would have just loved if he dove right into that world and just set the whole thing there. I get that. I get mm. that. Anytime you were in that world, it was really like a Bollywood musical. You right. know what I mean? Like like Bollywood musicals, like, again, like anytime there's a sex scene in a Bollywood movie, they just cut to a dance sequence, you know, <laughs> okay. what I mean? like yeah. that's that like represents sex in their in their cinematic language. Um, and and yeah, I felt like that's going on here, too, for sure. I would have loved to. But, you know, I still thought she did a fantastic job. And um, yeah, man, I don't know. I thought it was cool. Yeah, I mean, I definitely didn't hate it. I felt a little let down, but yeah, I walked away with some, with some positives. I like his style. He's a director. I'm like going to continue to watch anything that comes out with his name on it i'll be there oh, yeah. this definitely didn't convince me that like edgar wright fell off or anything like that i, I still love the guy um yeah I, I was just a little let down personally but i i see the appeal completely um i want to make another point about the erotic thriller thing or maybe i don't i may, I may be losing my train of thought here but uh i just thought of this only because on our last podcast someone had left a comment about eyes wide shut Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut. Yes. Right. Which is an erotic thriller. Mm-hmm. And boy, does that one lean into the eroticism. I mean, yeah. talk about like, I just complained about how erotic thrillers are not erotic. And that is the problem with them. And God bless Kubrick because <laughs> his genius knew that if you're going to make an erotic thriller, you have got to go all the way. You yeah. Know? Um, actually not all the way because then it's porn and erotic thriller shouldn't be porn, but you got to go <laughs> for it. And he certainly does in that movie. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I just thought I, that I'd mention that like, that's certainly like one of the great erotic thrillers. Uh, and there was some guy who mentioned it in the comments recently and he actually brought up um, something that I had never really noticed about the film. Cause I never really looked into the movie. The mm-hmm. way that, like, I kind of looked into The Shining, especially when I watched that documentary about The Shining uh, and about all the symbolism in The Shining. Yeah. And then certainly there was a lot of symbolism in there that I had never really understood. And um, and then there's, well, okay, let me just tell you the symbolism first. One of the great symbols in, uh, um, blanking on the name, what were we just talking about? The Shining or Eyes Wide Shut? Eyes wide shut. Eyes wide shut. So what, yeah. yeah. So one one of the great symbols is the rainbow. Right. Right. So at the beginning of the movie, these two women are, are walking. They're flanking Tom Cruise, and he's like, "Where are we going?" And they say, "We're going to go to the end of the rainbow." Right. And then finally, later in the film, his last stop before he's able to get to the party is this costume shop. Right. And the costume shop is closed at the time that he goes, but he kind of forces his way in there. He gets in and there's these two Asian men that are obviously having sex or doing things with an underage girl in the costume shop. And this girl is the daughter of the guy who owns the costume shop. Right. And 
you know, he like he's there. He's it's they're caught, but it's it's insinuated that this guy who rents out costumes is also renting out his daughter, mm-hmm. right? And the name of the costume shop is the Rainbow. Um, so it, it's really you know it's like so is that is that where this goes? Is that I mean like what is Kubrick say? I've actually been thinking about this ever since this guy brought up the comment, and I went back and re looked at it all. Like, what is Kubrick saying by this? You know, at the beginning of the film, it's Tom Cruise's character says, Where are we going? And then these two women, seduct, sort of like siren type women, are like, We're going to the end of the rainbow. But the end of the rainbow is it's it's a place where you get your mask in order to do all of the dark things that you want to do. Yeah. But it's also pedophilia. Yeah. Um, and and so it's like like, what is he saying about human desire or not even human desire but like the worst of human lust yeah and fantasy um you know it, it's it's uh it's a pretty you know it's a pretty interesting thing to think about like what that means and and then the reason why i talk about the shining and all the meaning in there and then also um 2001 is because so, uh, because i think that he stuffs in tons of symbols into his films mm-hmm. and he doesn't give you answers really which is one of the great things about kubrick movies is like you kind of leave them going oh god i know that there's more to this but i don't know what yeah you know like i can't understand like the shining does that with that ending yep you know he's in the picture so like fuck what does that mean you know like i i have asked that question forever what does this really mean yeah. he was here before you know like we could fucking talk about it forever and then the same with um 2001 right i i never really i was like for years i was like what are these the, i think they're called obelisks those black the, things. the monolith the monolith yeah like i'm like what does the monolith mean right what the fuck does it mean i would ask this forever and then of course the end like man is in this room in a yep. bed and then the monolith is there, but then there's these other objects there. And I'm like, what the hell does all of this mean? Um, and only after looking into it, one, I finally got to realize the monolith is kind of this representation for a super intelligence. Yeah. Right. Something that passes on information because it, it appears when the apes are just apes and fighting against another group of apes. But then after it appears, then the apes realize that they can use a tool mm-hmm. to kill. Right. And so then that tool is what allows them to get to their next step in their evolution and really dominate. And then, of course, the great cut, the mm-hmm. bone is thrown up and it hard cut. And now it's a spaceship, the new tool. And now we must overcome the tool. We first used the tool. That was the first step in our evolution. And of course, once that cut happens, we see the spaceship. Then man goes to the moon and uncovers the new monolith, which probably in, with the frequency, whatever happened, allows us then to meet our next level of, of evolution, which is defeating the tool, the artificial right. intelligence. But then I never understood the end of the, uh, the whole the movie when he's in the room and all this stuff. And then a couple of years ago, there was this recording by a Japanese uh, film critic who had interviewed Kubrick about 2001 when it came out that had been missing oh. for years. Um, and uh, and it, got, it, got, it finally came out. And uh, it's Kubrick talking about the end of 2001, A Space Odyssey. And he talks about how it's a museum, how at that point, man is in a museum. Right. And if you, if you remember the tops of the, the, the ceilings in the rooms that he's in, there are these lights, but like grid-like lights that are the exact same lights that you will find in the Louvre if you go to Paris. Okay. And you visit that and you visit probably the greatest museum on our planet. Right. And so, and he talks about this in the interview, but like, had he not spoken about that, I would have never put it together. Yeah. But but that just goes to show you like the level of detail that he is using when it comes to his symbolism. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, back to uh, Eyes Wide Shut, there's certainly something there that he's saying. We, maybe this is, you know, this is a good next topic or a topic for a later time. Um, but yes, uh, I don't know. 
since we were on the topic of erotic thrillers, I thought I'd bring yeah. that up. No, I'd, I'd love to get into Eyes Wide Shut more in another uh, episode. I've only seen that movie once and just did not know what to make of it. I feel like there's so much to unpack, as always, with Kubrick. That's why his movies are going to live on forever. You, you'll never be able to stop talking about them and just trading theories. And uh, that one, there's some interesting stuff out there. People think it's got like kind of connections to the underground of like Hollywood and stuff. So there's layers to that thing. And I, I think that'd be a great one to get into for sure. Yeah, we should do it. Definitely. Um, to wrap up this episode today, uh, we could get into a listener question if you wanted. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So got a few here, but I thought a good one for today, one that caught my eye is, is anything in film criticism objective? Is anything in film criticism objective? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I want to say no. Mm -hmm. You know, like even the worst movies someone might like. And uh, I don't know, like maybe not. Maybe you could arguably say that, you know, someone didn't execute like one long uncut take well but even, right. I, I don't know even if that's a, a objective but no I think, I think i think it's generally a subjective thing yeah i think the idea of is there any objectivity in film criticism i think that itself is like subjective like nobody can determine that obviously like you're saying like if somebody's trying to achieve like a long take and you see a clear cut like that's Small things like that, obviously, you'll notice. But overall, it's, I don't know. I go to movies to feel something, and it's its going to impact everyone in different ways. So how can you tell somebody that movie's objectively bad if it connected with them on an emotional level or if they appreciated a different visual aesthetic than you think is what should be the standard, you know? Right. I mean, look, I think there are some objective things that you can come to argue with over yeah. film, within film criticism. Because I'm thinking about one example, which is Donnie Brasco. Right. Right. Um, there's a scene in there where uh, Johnny Depp's character, Donnie, um, he's got to get close to Al Pacino's character. He's a cop, undercover cop. He's got to get close. And so he pretends to be like a jewelry guy. And so Al Pacino comes to him and goes, Hey, I got a ring. Right. I got a guy who sold it to me. This is, what do you think? You know, like, what do you think? And he looks at it. He goes, It's a Fugazi. It's a famous scene, the Fugazi scene. Mm -hmm. He goes, It's a Fugazi. And then, like an Al Pacino's, like fucking throwing his shoulders up. He's like, "What? <laughs> Forget you know, I, dude. Watch the scene again. What Al Pacino does with the shoulders in that scene? Oh my god, that guy's brilliant. So good. He is brilliant. No one could do. I mean, anyone else does what he does in that scene. He's like, I walk anywhere, forgot about right. You'd look yeah. like a joke. He fucking. Oh, he's so good. Um, but um, yeah, it's not a fugazi. He, here's my theory on the scene: is it not a fugazi? Johnny Depp doesn't know what the fuck he's doing when it comes to jewelry and he's just trying to get leverage he's trying to find a way in right so he tells him he goes oh it's a fugazi so then al pacino goes we're going to drive over to this motherfucker who sold me this ring and right. we're going to confront him about it together so now johnny depp's got to go so he's gotten what he wants he's gotten closer mm -hmm. but now he's got another obstacle to overcome he's like okay he's lying through his teeth so he gets to the strip club the guy who sold the ring the guy's like no it's a fucking great wrist five carat ring or whatever it is and um, and the only way out of it is he's got to beat the shit out of the guy, <laughs> you know, like he's the guy he's got to beat the shit out of him. He stuffs money in his mouth just to fucking end it so yeah. that he can get what he needs. And it says a lot about where this relationship's going to go is that ultimately it's, it's not going to end well. It's going to end violently you know, because it's the only way out of these lies mm -hmm. at a certain point when the stakes are this high. But I remember bringing that up one time. I think this was in a film theory class years ago. And someone was arguing with me. I was like, no, it's not a fake ring. And they had a whole other reason. And I guess you could debate it, but no, I think I'm correct. Right. You know what I mean? Like, so there's an objective film criticism, uh, but isn't that even criticism or, or is it, or am I just like uh, analyzing a movie? And is there a difference between criticism and film analyzing? I don't know, but that might be the only kind of stuff. Um, next question. Next question. All right. One second. <laughs> yeah. Like for me, I, I just go at everything subjectively. I mean, I've got the Miami vice poster on my wall back there. Some people might say like that movie looks like shit. 
Um, I think it's beautiful, the digital uh, cinematography, but yeah. that, that's a situation right there where you'll just, you'll get two sides and people just be like adamant about what they believe. And yeah, it's, it's definitely subjective and to me. I think those conversations are clearly subjective. Yeah, definitely. Except um, for when it comes to Miami Vice. What do you think of Miami Vice? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, look, I, I wasn't crazy about it. Um, right. I wasn't crazy about that. I wasn't crazy about the, what was the other one? Dillinger? The one that Michael Mann did. Public with, Enemies. Um, that Public one, Enemy. The digi- See, that's a case where, for me, the digital cinematography did not Terrible. work for that didn't time work. period. I didn't like it. Um, uh, I like the movie. It's okay. But, yeah, that visual aesthetic didn't work for me in that time period. Yeah, I wasn't crazy about Miami Vice. Um, but, you know, I can I get it. Some people love it. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's another good one. All right, this one I think is it's kind of fun to answer just because this guy's got a new movie coming up. Um, what's your favorite Paul Thomas Anderson film for each decade he's made movies in? Oh God. Well, <laughs> the the first one is clearly Boogie Nights. Yeah, for me, hands which down is, too. Which is my ultimate favorite of his. And I, I just saw that on the big screen uh, two days ago. Oh wow, and, man! In tears by the end of like that when oh, I was in wow. high school, hands down my favorite movie. I'm like seeing that on the big screen was nuts. It's his best movie. Yeah. Um, which is really interesting that a filmmaker comes out the gate like yep. that. Um, I actually have a lot of critiques on some of his later films. I'm not even a big Magnolia fan. No? No, I'm not. Um, we could get into that another time. Definitely. Uh, but that and then There Will Be Blood yeah. is my other favorite of his, which I just think is a freaking great film. Um but I don't know if I'm like nailing decade per decade. Like, am I? I don't even yeah, have like to look 90s, at you had Hard Eight, Boogie Nights, and Magnolia. Um, mm-hmm. To me, Boogie Nights is like Boogie a clear Nights. answer. Clear, clear winner. 2000s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. No uh, subjective. 2000s, Punch Drunk Love, There Will Be Blood. Um, I'm there a Punch Drunk and Love I like, guy. But oh, really? I like Punch Drunk Love. Yeah. You prefer that over There Will Be Blood? It depends on the mood. Like that's the thing with him is he's he has so many different types of movies. But I I'm doing a rewatch of all the stuff now going up into Licorice Pizza, so I'll determine it then. But Punch Drunk Love for now, yeah. Um, and then your 2010s, you got uh, The Master, Inherent Vice, and Phantom Thread. The Master. Yeah. Yeah. Over Phantom, Phantom Thread. Thread Inherent. Guy. Oh really? Yeah. Cool. Why? Um. I don't know. That movie just really spoke to me. I loved that he did his own cinematography on it. That was his first time. And just how gorgeous it looked like the lighting in that film. I just love his own cinematography. Yeah. He did it under a different name, but he did the cinematography for that film. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I just found that film. Like there were just little things I loved about it. Like the locations I just found just very film. pleasing. Um, it was really funny to me too. Like on paper, that film, it just sounded so dry. And going in, I was honestly a little bit nervous. Like, uh, is this, I paid money for this to go see it in a theater. Is this going to bore me? And I, I don't know. I just got really into it. I found it really funny, like really entertaining. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just think it's one of his, like, he's got that later phase where his films, there's a more like prestigious element to them. And I think that one was having the most fun with itself out of that kind of era of his filmmaking. Yeah. Um, you know, those, both those movies are very similar, actually. Um, Phantom Thread and The Master. Yeah. Whereas in, I don't think he had a fucking good idea for the ending of either of those movies. No. And I think, <laughs> and I shouldn't say that, but like, I feel as if he's opted for this kind of, let's make the ending really strange out of nowhere for the sake of like doing something different. Right. So that I can keep that air of, you know prestige cinema and i i haven't bought it once to be honest i was very disappointed in the ending of the master um you know i mean look maybe i was i thought the master was going to be like some really amazing analysis of the mind of l ron hubbard yeah right going into it i was like oh fuck this dude's doing the movie about scientology and L. Ron Hubbard, whatever you think of the guy, oh my God, the guy created a religion that people follow today yeah. that's worth billions, okay? And that's a fucking feat. 
Okay. There's yeah. It's one thing to be Steve Jobs and like make the iPhone. Okay. Yeah. You know, and it's another thing to be like, you know, Trump and become president. Like these are characters that are like larger than life. But L. Ron Hubbard is like right up there for me because, yeah. it, you know, like I think less people start religions than become presidents yeah. in like a century basis successfully. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, it might be the hardest fucking thing to do. Like within like look in the last hundred years like you had you know a bill gates and you had a thomas edison and you had a steve jobs right how many people started new religions successfully yeah nothing that reached the heights of uh what scientology know, has become jim jones botches his attempt to kill everybody <laughs> you know like yeah fucking l ron hubbard's got a religion that is just still going like that is massive to me yeah um and i was so excited to see a film about that character in that mind right right and it didn't go there it was more it wasn't it I, the movie actually wasn't about that the way that there will be blood is very much so about a great man and what greatness does to someone um and i love films like that i love when movies explore larger than life characters and citizen kane is considered by many to be the greatest movie of all time yeah and it's a fucking takedown of william randolph hearst now, that's what i thought the master was going to be and that's what it could have been mm -hmm. and that's what i think it should have been and it wasn't and th and then the ending really fucking through i just didn't understand what it all meant i'm like oh, okay and i don't know that there's like a kubrick-esque level to that mystery either um and i felt the same with phantom threat where i just was kind of like okay he just kind of was like juggling and then at the very end for his last great trick instead of like catching it behind his neck or doing something he just kind of right throws them in the air because that's art and like that's cool and maybe i'm wrong like maybe i'm seeing this wrong um and i don't mean to be critical of the guy because i know it's fucking sacrilegious especially if you're a filmmaker <laughs> but that's my thoughts and inherent vice i couldn't follow inherent yeah wow inherent vice is um one of the hardest to follow films i've ever seen i've grown to really appreciate that movie um just like the, the kind of vibe of it and just going along for the ride and getting lost in it. I have gotten to a point where like, there's a point in the movie where the main character, Joaquin Phoenix's character literally has like a board where he's trying to connect the dots. And that's what I was doing with that movie at a certain point when I was like on my fourth viewing and I had like a notepad trying to connect everything. And I got to a point where I did kind of get how everything connected, but oh, yeah, man, I sort of just watched that's that awesome movie. That's awesome you did that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was like you got determined. a fucking inherent vice notepad i was a, a paul thomas anderson fan of this movie i'm like i don't I fucking paul know thomas what just anderson. happened so i had to really dedicate my time to understanding it but yeah i yeah. mean I, I like everything he's made but to me when i when i watch boogie nights that is i i did a little review of it recently and i wrote in there like that's the kind of movie that made me fall in love with the medium in the first place yeah which one wait, which one boogie nights oh boogie nights fucking best dude. yeah it is it's like hands Great. down but, but you know also there will be blood okay so look at that ending that mm. ending at least relates to the arc of the central character yeah he has truly lost his soul he can't even show love to his son yep right he's fucking shooting shotguns in his home right it's like the symbolism of that, the power of the shotgun and the blast of it, and then just like the complete lack of any care. Like that's the perfect ending yeah. for that movie, right? And it it really gives you a cathartic education of like, wow, don't be a person like that. Yeah. That is the destruction of the human spirit. That is where ruthless ambition will lead to your own demise, like the story of Macbeth. Um and that's good storytelling to me because it it's fucking bow and it's saying something. Whereas these other ones, they're a little too, and maybe he's saying things that I'm not getting, but they're, yeah, I'm not, I can't read them. Right. And therefore I just feel like he's not really sure of what he's saying. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I didn't find that as much with Phantom Thread, but with the master for sure, like, going along i thought that was like a brilliant film brilliant character study and it sort of just started like stumbling towards the end for me it's been a while since i've watched it but it just it didn't wrap up in a way i would have liked um mm. 
not really sure what he was going for. But yeah, even as a person who loves that movie, that ending doesn't entirely work for me. Uh, yeah, you want to wrap it up there? Save some questions for next time. Yeah, let's do All it. All right. Uh, thank you for listening as always, guys. Uh, if you haven't checked out our first two episodes up on the Art or Pictures YouTube channel, go subscribe and check out our other content. Also, yes. check us out on Instagram and Twitter, Art or Pictures. And we got a Discord. Isn't that right? We do have a Discord. Yes. It's not very active yet, but it's about to be popping off soon. Definitely. Please like and subscribe. It really helps us. Helps us to grow this thing. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.